Hey everyone, so in this video we are going to review Unit 5 of AP Calc AB. So let's start off with just a quick review of the topics you'll need to know. So you need to know the MVT or the Mean Value Theorem. You need to know the Extreme Value Theorem and then basically from there you need to really understand the first and second derivatives and you need to know how to use them and apply them to real world problems. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the first topic, which is the MVT. So the MVT basically helps us connect the average rate of change, which is given here, to the instantaneous rate of change, which is given here. And remember, the instantaneous rate of change is given by the derivative, whereas the average rate of change is basically found just using our typical algebra formula of y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This is just the calculus notation, but it's the exact same thing that you've already been doing throughout your algebra courses. So let's talk about just kind of conceptually what this means. This basically means that if you're driving from point A to point B, your average speed along the way, let's just say it was 60 miles per hour, then at some point in time, you would have had to have been going exactly 60 miles per hour. So that's basically what the MVT guarantees. Um, other thing of note with the MVT is the conditions. So in order to apply it, you need to check that your function is continuous and differentiable. So for continuity, of course, you want to look for any of the three discontinuities, which would be a whole, a jump, or a vertical asymptote. And then for differentiability, you want to look for any corners, cusps, or vertical tangent lines. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Next up is the EVT or extreme value theorem. This basically helps us find the most or the least of something. So like the maximum or minimum value. And basically the EVT tells us or guarantees that these values exist as long as the function is continuous. So I kind of just said it, but just to reiterate that. So the condition is that the function must be continuous on the closed interval A, B. And basically the EVT guarantees that the continuous function on a closed interval will have both a highest and lowest value somewhere in that interval, or said another way, a maximum and minimum value. So again, to check for the conditions, because it has to be continuous, you wanna keep an eye out for jumps, holes, or vertical asymptotes, and you wanna be especially careful with piecewise functions here. Next up are applications of the first derivative. So remember the first derivative basically gives us the slope. So these are the key ideas that you have to know. I highly recommend that you memorize these. So when the derivative is positive, it tells us the function is increasing, right? Or going up, it has a positive slope. When the derivative is negative, it tells us that the function is decreasing or it has a negative slope. A critical point occurs when the first derivative is equal to zero or when it's undefined. A relative maximum can be found when the derivative, the first derivative, goes from positive to negative, right? So it would look like that. A relative minimum occurs when the first derivative goes from negative to positive. So it looks something like that. And so basically we can use the first derivative test to find these relative maximum and minimum values. Oftentimes you do kind of a table of values and that's how you find it. And then we can also use the candidates test and that will help us find absolute or global extrema. I did another more in-depth video on that. So I'm gonna kind of just leave that as what it is for now. Okay, and quickly just to review these key terms, relative extrema, that basically just means you have something relative to the other points around it. So an example would be like that. So this would be a relative minimum, that would be a relative minimum, but let's just say this function was cut off here. This would be the absolute minimum because it's the absolutely lowest point of that function. And then over here, we would have a relative maximum, another relative maximum. And then here again, let's assume that this function was cut off here. This would be the absolute maximum because it's the absolutely highest value. Whereas these are just higher relative to the other points around it. All right, let's go ahead and move on.
Okay, next up we have applications of the second derivative. So here are the key ideas you have to know here. A function is concave up when the second derivative is positive. So it looks like kind of a smiley face or a cup. And then it is concave down when the second derivative is negative. It looks kind of like a frown. A point of inflection is when the second derivative changes sign. So if you go from concave up to concave down, you would have a point of inflection somewhere like what I drew there on the screen. The second derivative test will help us classify our critical points. So remember, we can use the first derivative to get the critical points, and then we can use the second derivative to help us determine what type of relata relative extrema we have. So whether it's a relative minimum or a relative maximum, right? Because remember, if it's concave up, it's gonna be a min. And if it's concave down, it's gonna be a relative max. And then if you get both of them equal to zero, so first derivative and second derivative equal to zero, the test would be considered inconclusive. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, so this is basically how to apply the first and second derivatives together. We've already covered some of this, so I'm going to make it quick. Here are the key ideas that you need to know. So to reiterate, the first derivative describes the slope of the function. If it's positive, it's increasing. If it's negative, it's decreasing. A relative maximum occurs when the first derivative goes from positive to negative. A relative minimum occurs when the first derivative goes from negative to positive. The second derivative tells us the concavity of the function. When the second derivative is positive, it's concave up. When the second derivative is negative, it's concave down. An inflection point occurs when the second derivative is equal to zero. I should also note for the first derivative, I didn't include this here as a bullet, but I should have, a critical point is when the first derivative equals zero. All right, and then this is how the graphs are related to one another here. So when the first derivative is zero, that tells us that we are going to have a critical point and we are going to have a relative extrema. So either a relative minimum or a relative maximum. When the second derivative is zero, that tells us that we are going to have an inflection point. And then we've kind of already covered this, but basically the first derivative sign will tell us whether the function is increasing or decreasing. And then the second derivative sign tells us whether the function is concave up or concave down. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. All right, next up in this unit is how to apply everything we've just covered. So optimization problems often involve finding the minimum or maximum values of a given function, and then basically using all of that information to optimize for a certain value. This is really best described by going through examples. So I'm quickly gonna go over the steps, but then please check out my other video that reviews this more in depth. So basically the steps are as follows. First, you want to pick out the quantity that is to be optimized. So if it says maximize area or minimize cost, that's the first thing you wanna do. And then you wanna write its equation. So for example, it could be area and it could be length times width. Then you're gonna write your constraint equation. So the question will give you some quantity that is set or fixed. So for example, it could be the perimeter. So we might have to write out the constraint equation for the perimeter, which could be length plus two times width equals, I don't know, 100 meters or something like that. Next, you're gonna use substitution. So you're gonna rewrite your original optimization equation from step one in terms of a single variable. So it could be in terms of length, for example. Next, you're gonna take the derivative to find the critical points. And then lastly, you're gonna verify the critical points, meaning you're gonna use the second derivative test to identify it as a maximum or minimum value. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, next up is implicit differentiation. So my students tend to get really confused with this unit, um, but really you've pretty much been doing this all along. It's just a different way of writing what you've already been doing. So for example, when you're doing y equals x squared plus 10, and you take the derivative of that, you might write y prime equals 2x, right? So the only difference when you're doing implicit differentiation is that your equation is already going to be in terms of both x and y. What I mean by that would be like x squared plus y squared equals 25. So here we have a circle. And notice how we don't have y isolated, right? We have x squared and y squared together. And we don't just have y equals, right? 
So the point of implicit differentiation is that sometimes it's really hard algebraically to solve an equation for y. Like here, this would be relatively straightforward, but in other questions, it can get much more difficult. And so it's basically a technique to just take the derivative while it's in this form and then later solve for dy dx. So basically, instead of isolating y first, we take the derivative, then we get what y prime or dy dx is equal to. So basically, you're just doing the algebra later, which just sometimes strategically is easier, easier rather than doing the algebra first and then taking the derivative. So you're taking the derivative, then doing the algebra. Okay, so just to tie this all together, unit five is really about applying the first and second derivatives to solve real world problems. So we're really bringing calculus to life in this unit and we're exploring the why, right? Why find the derivative? How could we actually use this in the real world? All right, thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.